Welcome, everybody. It is the Book Fest Spring 2023. And this panel discussion is on the topic of AI and its impact on writers and readers. Artificial intelligence has been making headlines across various industries, and publishing industry is no exception. The rapid advancements in technology have resulted in AI becoming an increasingly popular tool for authors, for publishers, and believe it or not, for readers. While AI has the potential to revolutionize the way that we write and read and consume literature, it also brings up questions and concerns about its impact on the traditional publishing industry and the future of lit literature. We're gonna be discussing various topics, including the use of AI and generating content, the impact of AI on the creative process, the role of AI in personalized content delivery and the ethical considerations of AI and literature. And we have two distinguished panelists with us here. Our first is Russell Nolte. He is a USA Today bestselling author and the publisher of Wannabe Press. Russell has extensive experience in the publishing industry and is known for his innovative approach to storytelling. He has also written and produced a number of successful graphic novels, including Katrina Hates the Dead and Pixie Dust. Our second panelist is Lori H. Schwartz. She is also known as the Tech Cat and Lori is recognized as a leader in the field of emerging technology. And she's been at the forefront of many digital and mobile innovations over the past two decades. She has worked with some of the world's largest brands, including Disney, AT&T, and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Hi, guys. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. We are both real. We're not avatars. <laughs> yet. This uh, year. Uh, yeah, Next year. I know I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you were an avatar, would you admit you were an avatar? Oh, they're good, good, good question. That I is think good. I There's no be. regulation, so... Right. I would be acknowledged. I would acknowledge who I was. <laughs> if it was based on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I wanna I wanna start by asking you, what did you think of that introduction? Did I hit your introductions well? Did that sound okay? Does that cover everything? Yeah. I think so. As I was preparing for this, I asked, these were the two prompts I gave AI. They were, can you write an introduction to a panel discussion about AI and how it affects readers and writers? That was the first part. The second was write a brief introduction about the two panelists, Russell Nolte and Lori H. Schwartz. I gave them nothing else about either one of you. And that's what it spit out. And I used it almost verbatim. Oh my God, I love that. That's, that's great. That's great. So, And that <laughs> brings up like one of the best uses of AI, which is to do stuff that is annoying and time consuming and people don't want to do. Uh, I have no, well, well, Laurie, do you want to talk about like where we are in AI first before we get sure. into like, the heat of the discussion or the meat of it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cause I, I tend to look at um, things top, sort of top level on a, on a trends level um, because I'm um, speaking with and talking with folks from a lot of different business categories with my special sauce being media and entertainment. But I think the way to look at artificial intelligence right now is it's basically software with great hardware and also other technologies like 5G and the uh, sort of focus on cloud, leveraging the cloud, um, which is really big data centers to move data around at a fa really fast level. That software is, is helping us with, like you said, Russell, mundane tasks, repetitive tasks, things that in the past required a human being to dig deep into an Excel document, things that have a pattern so that a machine can learn it and then repeat it multiple times. Um, so if you think of uh, the best analogy for me is in Photoshop, there's a setting where if you have thousands of images that you need to change the same setting on, you can literally set a setting and have it spit out those images. That's machine learning. And that that's one of the most popular uses of artificial intelligence right now is those repetitive tasks. Um, basically, artificial intelligence takes information that we give it and it just runs it through. Um, so what chat GPT and all these different things uh, that you mentioned uh, Desiree are doing is basically, it's just a, a search engine. 
you know, um, that's the best way to think of it, I think, is it's a really smart search engine because the uh, what you read back to us was basically provided to you by the Internet. It, it's basically spidered out, grab the stuff and put it together um, in an intelligent sentence structure based on parameters that we fed it. Um, so th that's what's great about it is that it is a smarter search engine. Um, and I think for many folks in various job categories and other places, it's going to solve a lot of those mundane tasks in a faster and more economical way. Sure. I do want to break, I, I want to uh, draw attention to one thing because it's the conversation that I always have. Uh, generally, chat GPT specifically, but in most of these writing centered ones, AI is not, is basically predictive text in advance. Like they are generating what the most likely next word is. They're not actually, I mean, I guess they are thinking on some form, but like it's not intelligence in the way that like you think of as general intelligence. Mm -hmm. AI is very, very good at doing specific tasks. So you can train a, an AI very specifically to do like one thing. I wanted to say maybe two things, but really it's one thing. And there might be a million of them doing a million functions, but like we are not at like anywhere close to a general AI, like a, a general uh, intelligence. This is very specific, even though it looks like general intelligence. It is, it is, it is specific to whatever tasks. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I think the other thing is, we, we call it artificial intelligence, but to your point, Russell, it's really a misnomer because it's, it's not a living being. It's software and hardware coming together based on programming that we've given it. So, you know, there's no original thinking happening here, um, at least right now. Um, it's, it's learning and maybe getting smarter, but um, there's, there's not, there's not, you know, this, machine that has you know heart and soul yet <laughs> i'm not ruling it out but that um, we like, know of right yeah, um we know i'm one i'm curious about how much you feel we can trust ai because you're right it, it's a tool and it's going to spit out at us what it finds out there that's why i kind of like looked at you both too after i read your intros because i was like okay that sounds like yeah it sounds like Lori, but i don't know did you do work with Disney. Do, is that the correct titles of Russell's books? How much do you feel we can actually trust what AI gives uh, us? You know, it's funny that you say that because I was thinking, I didn't really, where did they get the Disney thing from? Because I know I've listed <laughs> a bunch of <laughs> I have, I mean, I have done work for everyone at this point, um, but it's just interesting that that was the brand that popped because I usually don't list that. So that was interesting. Um, I, I, I think that, it's trust is an interesting word too in, in its own right right uh, because it's just like what's going on in all the schools right now where what do they do about chat gpt and all these other engines that are coming out you know how do they um you know students sometimes sign or agree to a code of ethics and can a teenager really be put to task on a code of ethics because <laughs> that's the time in their life where they're pressing against ethics. So um, I, I think that anything that you get from an AI engine does require a certain amount of, uh, you know, especially when it comes to writing, a certain amount of like touching base and checking in and, and looking at it. And, and I think, and again, I know Russell, you're gonna come at this from a different perspective, but when you use ChatGPT to generate something like what you did, I think it requires you going back over it and making fixes and tweaking it, especially when it comes to writing. I, th I think also you're going to want to look over the images that Photoshop just spit out or whatever it is that the algorithm you asked it to do. You still want to check it. So I, th I think you have to. Now, there are certain automations in factories and in other business categories where they don't check it anymore because it's really simple and it's been proven out. But there will be times when there will be an error just based on the data producing an error. Um, and that's why the human element needs to continually partner with AI. And that's the thing. That's the, I think, this, the science fiction trope 
if I may, that takes over a lot of these conversations is that we're just letting AI take over and do everything. And that's where we're going to get into trouble. And the reality is that AI is a tool just like everything else. It's like it comes up on my phone and it says, you've got to leave in 15 minutes because of heavy traffic or you'll be late for your appointment. But I still have to get up and leave. You know what I mean? Like all those things. Like I love it when my phone recommends, oh, did you want this phone number added into this contact? Or when it does tell me how long something is going to do. Or even in the morning, I don't know if this has happened to you guys, but if you have an appointment on your calendar, like I go to Pilates twice a week. So when I get into my car in the mornings on that day that I have that calendar appointment in my phone, it recommends for me to go to Pilates. It gives me the address and it says, do you want to go here? Because it got that piece of data. Things like that are fabulous, but I'm still saying yes and I'm still driving the car there. So that's the piece to take away all the fear is that we're not all of a sudden surrendering, you know, the steering wheel to a robot. We are still in charge here. We are working with this. It's a tool. Okay. My turn is, <laughs> I, I am not a Luddite. I run a conference called The Future of Publishing. I am all about having this conversation. My fear is that people, in general, are lazy. Me included. The way that I... I am able to tamp my laziness is that when I search something, I can say, oh, well, that's not a respected website. I'm not going to trust that. That is a respected website. I can trust that. And my fear of, of, uh, of, uh, of people relying too much on AI is that like it requires a diligence that in the history of humanity, nobody has ever demonstrated on a mass level to be able to be trusted with. And like, I don't know if you know about the, uh, should you boil a baby, uh, thing that happened a couple of days ago, but like when the new Tell Bing, us. when the new yeah, Bing, uh, I think it was Bing, maybe Bard, one of these search engines, someone asked, should you boil a baby? And the search engine replied, yes. And they gave like a whole reason, but the, the what the, they were answering is, should you boil a a baby's bottle before you give it to them. But that was not the whole context. What they got was, should you boil a baby? And like, that is a very extreme example. I feel like nine, a hundred percent of people would know not to boil a baby. Maybe not a hundred, but like almost every person would, uh, would agree with that. But that is, the problem is that at last, when I last looked, uh, the last research that I read is that these search, these chat GBTs are about 80% accurate. And the longer a piece is, the less accurate they become and the harder it is for, to string all of these things together. And people are not going to go back and check. So they are going to, even now, people are taking advice from very, very questionable websites that everyone knows are questionable. If you start to say, if you start to synthesize all of this into one form where you can't even see the sources or you have to click very deeply to see the sources, that's a big, 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 big problem that like just not even like I would do the research. Like, I don't care. Like, I like research, but like most people are not like that. And I do not like researching everything. I do not having I do not like having to distrust, but verify everything. And that I feel is the world that we have lived in for a long time. And if we're allowing uh, these search engines or things to just compile these massive collections of, 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 of data and then literally feed us what the truth is, like now we're living in a dystopian nightmare. And um, I, I'm, I'm less concerned with how good actors operate. I'm much more concerned about how bad actors operate or neutral actors operate. And I don't think we have a good solution for what happens when somebody uses chat GPT, GPT to, to make a thousand short stories and uses then an automatic uh, submission tool to submit a thousand stories to Clark world in 10 minutes. So they have to go close submission now. Like that's not, that's like a few people that have done that, but they have destroyed 
one of the most open platforms and highest paying uh, short story collection uh, resources for authors in like a week. And that's just going to keep happening because bad actors are going to outweigh all of the good that could happen in. Uh, uh, um, and I know that because that's generally what I've seen happen in every technology, which is a shame because I do see a lot of good that yeah. this specific thing can do. We use AI to do audiobooks um, for books that we can't afford to do full audio productions for because we believe that a large percentage of our readership are disabled um, or they are uh, dyslexic or in some way they are impaired and they need something that's better than the talk to speech. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the bare balance we've said is even though we may be taking a job away from a narrator, we are never going to actually narrate those books. And like, uh, without having like 10 times the amount of money we have, but we need something for the subset of our population that needs something that, that, that has accessibility concerns. And those are the weights that everyone's going to come down on with this AI debate. Um, but man, like it really allows for bad actors to have a field day out there. So, so Russell, here's my comeback to that. <laughs> Is that bad actors have existed before AI and everything else, right? That's the nature of humanity is that we, the light and the dark always balance together somehow. Um, and every new technology that comes out, there are people that definitely abuse it. And then what happens is because we're fantastically intelligent and innovative, we figure out new models around it. So some things that have been established a long time that were wonderful, like the submission solution that you were talking about, may now no longer work in our current society with the current software and solutions that are available. But what is going to happen is using human ingenuity and perhaps even the same AI tools, we will come up with a new solution. And that, that's just it. We can't sit in the dark as my grandmother used to say, you know, I'll just sit in the dark. Don't worry about me. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I think that evolution is going to happen. We are going to keep inventing things that challenge other things that worked. And we're going to have to keep iterating. I mean, the reality right now which is so interesting about ChatGPT, which taught me something uh, just reading about all these solutions is that human beings think and write in bursts. Um, you've probably heard this before. We write in bursts, like the way our brains work. We have these periods of, of um, I don't know if you want to call it thought or innovation or you know creativity. ChatGPT doesn't. And so what the, what the AI tools now that are taking apart chat GPT paragraphs and essays is finding is that human beings have a way of writing that no matter what right now chat GPT or other solutions like that can't do it. So we've kind of mini solved for that. High schools, colleges are gonna have to figure out, they may have to, you may have to submit your papers now through an engine before your teacher gets it. You know, um, publishers have for years sent papers through plagiarism solutions where you checked against other um, papers. So it, I, I just think we can't be worried all the time about what new innovation is going to come along, but it's a chance to innovate and it's a chance to figure out an even better solution. Um, it's a drag when bad actors come, but there's, there's no stopping it. We can't, we can't not ever change or evolve. So we just have to keep going. Yeah. But like, do we come up with better solutions? Like I've looked, at, I mean, in the history of human, of like the last 30 years has been about like advancing way too fast and then, and then taking regulations away, not like adding to, and like well, right, every yeah, time a new, <laughs> every time a new technology comes, people say like, we should regulate it. And they're like, you can't stop innovation. You can't stop innovation. And like, look where we are now in the post, post capitalist hellscape like and all of yeah. that comes so like i don't think right. it's I, I don't think it's 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 out of line to say hey this is as bad or worse as any innovation that's come along maybe it's as good 
but it's at least as bad as it's, any it's innovation that's come along as well. Days. It's very early days. Look, I'm not saying that this isn't going to blow up in our faces and that we're going to kill the planet or whatever. I, I mean, we are definitely headed in an interesting time with a lot of issues with both our government, the environment. But but if you step back and go, OK, well, there are some interesting innovations like COVID, which is a, you know, was a horrible pandemic, also created a lot of innovation, both in the medical field, um, in how food delivery works and tons of business categories have innovated because of the pandemic. So we're emerging out of this like horrible economic and medical catastrophe with new solutions, new modes of behavior, new business models. Are all of them fantastic and here to say? Probably not, but that's the nature of humanity. And I, and I think AI in general as a tool is solving huge medical problems, is helping manufacturing, um, and even in education, I mean, there are things about it that are being leveraged in a positive way. So yes, uh, there are problems. We're in a difficult time. Uh, government cannot keep up with what's happening in technology. I was just um, at a conference where we were discussing parenting and technology and what do parents do? And I brought up the point that is it the government's you know, um, responsibility? Is it the parent's responsibility? Or is it the tech company's responsibility? And the truth is, it's all three, but where is it really going to end up? It's going to end up back in the parent's lap. And it means that I, as a parent of a 13-year-old, I'm on her, I'm managing her internet time, I'm looking at what she's doing. It is a whole job now that I didn't have two years ago. And sure. I don't have a choice about it. On the other hand, she has a social life online that she probably wouldn't have had. Um, without these tools, she's drawing, she's compositing video, she's doing all these things that at 13, you know, when I was 13, I could have not even dreamed of. So it, everything comes with a yin and a yang, you know, if that's the sure. best way to say it. So let me, t I want I want to say generally, and then I'm going to bring it back to writing specifically. Can I, can I interject one quick thing? Because sure. the YouTube algorithm and the AI is watching, careful of that C word, because they can get get a little upset with us which which c word <laughs> c-o-v-i-d uh it, it okay. really will pick uh, up that okay. word and yeah. okay okay, okay. Got it. Uh, uh, all right so i use ai we all use ai constantly the yeah. difference between generally what i see in ai and specifically with the two things that have caused nightmare scenarios in the industries that i use which is the ai art and the ai writing in yeah. general, the companies outside of these two categories have intense regulations internally. Like they are do they they are so careful with like how they use all of this data. My mm -hmm. wife works for companies that like work with AI and like the same thing. Like they are constantly having ethical ethical conversations about how to use people's data, how to pay them properly, how to do X, Y, and Z thing. And, and and paying people for their time, energy, and effort, as opposed to what has happened in the past year where the customer has become the beta tester, a free beta tester. And the things that they are using are other people's intellectual property. And even if it's one data point out of the billion that are inside, for instance, um, uh, uh, Dolly or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. That's a problem. Now, if if there was a scenario where it was like, okay, we're making everything opt in, like we're gonna we're gonna like just destroy this last data set, and like everything's gonna have to be rebuilt with like all opt in art or public domain art, all public domain writing. Like we are not going to take the writing that you're using to put into our engine and use it to help improve the engine unless you let us do that. All of those things would make this so much more ethical. And while I would still say, well, like, but you're not arting, like it's not art. Like you're not, you're, you're, you're the pub project manager of the art maybe, but like, you're not making art, like you're not making writing. And while I would probably say, you know, I've read a lot of these AI stories. And if I read any single one of them in like an anthology, I would be like, I mean, it's fine. Like it's fine filler. Like it was fine. Like I don't, I, I've never been like, wow, that's really bad. I've never said it's really good. And I've read a lot of filler stories and anthologies. So like, there's all sorts of ways that 
even as a publisher, I could be like, oh man, I'm 10,000 words short. Like, how do I ethically make this happen? But I can't use any of those resources now because I have no idea and they are opaque about how they gather their data and how they use their data. And I have even problems using the AI um, audiobook software that we use because it is not clear whether they are going to use that and feed that my work through their writing engine and like improve that. And all of those things could be very easily barriered off. And I would have almost no problem with any of the things that are happening now if if some regulations were put in place by the companies, because I agree with you those that uh, in those three pillars, but the company part of that is completely falling down on the writing and art side of it. I, I, I can't address that, but I, I understand your frustration. And generally speaking, someone like you is probably the person that is going to step up and cause some change. Cause that again is the nature of humanity. Like I have all these colleagues who are world builders, they're deep inside of uh, these uh, VR social platforms, and they're having the most creative and amazing time in their lives using generative AI art tools to build worlds in VR and metaverses. Um, and for them, um, they're, they are using already created, you know, generic things and building new things um, and evolving what is considered architecture and world building and all of these things they're in this they're having a heyday i mean i've never seen some of these people as happy as they are right now with what they're generating now could i say that the world they built is their world because it's based on other content you know that's a challenging concept right there but maybe we have to evolve what all of that means i mean let, let's be honest when's the last time that you saw any TV show that wasn't derivative of something else. That's a different, that's a different yeah. piece, but yes, uh, yes. I mean, yes, right. everything is derivative. And I think I would- derivative. I mean, we're, you know, we're two, over 2000 years into this country, <laughs> but, we're in, but we're into many other years of other civilizations. Sh sure, so. so if you're saying that AI can be used to use generative art, so I could go into VR and like I can build from pieces that already exist. Or I could take a story and say, this is, a, my friend Yud does this. He takes AI stories and he builds out on them. My friend Matthew mm -hmm. makes takes AI art and he like builds out on top of the, and, and layered on yeah. there. Like that's an entirely different scenario. If you are saying, um, generate me a world and then you're clicking it and the world just generates and you're like, okay, cool, I created a world. That 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 is the difference that, from. I don't I don't I, I I'll I'll bump in here a little bit. I don't think she's saying that, and I think it's very true. Everything is derivative, and it's just a matter of we can argue slippery slope. Where would our worlds be now? Every single fantasy world out there, if it wasn't for J.R.R. Tolkien, would elves be a thing? Everybody kind of knows what an elf is, and if somebody can build their world by saying, "I want an elf." But now I want my elf to also, you know, sparkle and can't go out in the sunlight. So I think that's where this can really be helpful and advantageous to those writers, especially in the science fiction and fantasy world. So sorry, I just wanted to kind of jump in there. No, it, it, it's interesting though. I think Russell, you're in a really challenging moment in, in, in how you've navigated, like the tools that you know, the way you've done things, uh, the ethics around all of it are really being challenged. And I totally understand that. But I also think that it creates opportunity. I don't know what it is and I'm not in your area, so I can't even begin to suggest to you how to move through it. But I, I, I just, because I, I am on the top of a lot of trends and I've seen moments like this before, there is going to be tools that will be created to protect high school submissions and things like that. Things are happening already now. Schools are on this. Like I'm telling you, I got a letter from my daughter's school saying, this is how we're dealing with this. You know, this is going to be, we're going to need to run stuff through engines, but we also have some ethics here. And I, I think things, it's its an interesting but challenging time, but I, I, don't, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle is the issue. So all, all we can do is, is sort of try to set up 
protective walls to a certain extent without curbing the innovation. Yeah, you know? I mean, I'm I'm with you. You're I the guy yeah. to do it, to be honest. You're like, the guy to do it because you're sitting in the middle of the muck right now in this space and you know what your pain points are. Yeah, I mean, that's why know? we created the conference that we did. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think you can put it back in the box. I do think that with very little... Well, that's not true because they do like the, the data sets that they have are so huge. So it would take yeah. time, but like it is possible to unwind this, th th this and like do it in a, the, in the ethical way that a lot of other AI is done. Like you talked about that, the world, like building the yeah. worlds in VR, yeah. like yeah. those artists were paid for their time and effort to generate all of this stuff. The programmers so, were paid for their time yeah. to do that. Yeah. So like when I talk about the AI audiobooks that we do, one of the reasons that I'm able to like live with myself doing them is because the people who did the voices were paid for their voices to be used. And like, that's right. the part that they are, that, that like is the artistic part of it is the, is, is, is the, so if there were just better guardrails in writing in the, on the writing and art side of things, because you've already, we've already seen, we like the the zenith of people's profile pictures that were like all generated by AI like that that like I just read an article that like that it's gone down like 80 percent in the past like two weeks because like the trend is over so like then this happens all of the time in where people get really 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 upset about a thing and then like the world like uh, uh, burns down and then like two months later like they're past the thing and some people are still using it but like most people are not and I do think we're at a time right now where you can say, okay, like, why do you writing and art people get to do this thing that no other AI companies can get? And I hope that, other, honestly, I hope other AI companies like come down hard on like chat GDP and, and, uh, and, yeah, Dolly well, they and are. all of these I mean, people in AI because yeah, yeah they, like they're, they're giving the entire industry a bad name by the way that they, they uh, they use people's work and the way that they basically charge people to test their products. Yeah, I, I, so I, I uh, stumbled upon a character AI engine the other day and I had a conversation with Loki. <laughs> it was, and I'm a huge, you know, I'm a like franchise-aholic. I love Marvel. I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I love all that stuff. Total geek. And uh, so I had a, it was like a 20 minute chat with Loki. And it was just a Loki that someone had created. I don't even know, but I, it was the most fun I've had in a long time because the, the responses fit my understanding of that IP. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was fantastic. And I, um, and I would pay for that. Now this is just a beta, but um, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Like if that's how, if that's where chat GPT goes or things like that, where we can actually create worlds where I would love to go hang out with Captain Picard from Star Trek and do a therapy session with him. That would be fantastic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I mean, obviously we have to put some safeguards on all of that stuff, but I, 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 I think um, you're in a really challenging moment. And I think the fact that you're questioning it and pushing on the ethics and pushing on the fairness and the monetization will create change and, and evolution. I just think we have to be really careful to shut down or go, or maybe we go back a little bit and then we step to the left, but um, well, holding back well, things never works either. Well, I know? thought it was really interesting how the NFT debate uh, fizzled, but really like changed. Uh, well, I don't know how much has changed, but like, People, when people said that the main problem with NFTs was that it was made on the Ethereum blockchain because the Ethereum yeah. blockchain is horrible at like, people were like, oh, well, so I can just take this technology and I'll make it on a, a better blockchain that like isn't so yeah. environmentally. And like, there was legitimate change that like really addressed my main issue with NFTs, which right, was like, right, right. I like my personal feelings aside, whether I think they're great or dumb, like I just don't think you they were necessary to create so much environmental hazard. And when you take that away, I'm like, well, like, I don't know if people like NFTs, like 
whatever, like let them have their NFTs, let them have their AI, like, let them have all of this stuff that they want. Yeah. Like, I don't care if you want to have a thing with Loki. I do care if a person boils their baby though. Like that part, I do start right. caring yeah. about. And, well, like, there, right. if, uh, there is a reality to uh, the lack of education in this country. <laughs> right. And, you know, we can only control so, so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it brings up the, a great point. And Lori's thrown this over to you, Russell, and I can see you doing the, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking. So what is it that you would want the publishing industry, the publishers, the mm-hmm. editors, like, is there a code of ethics that you see being written up? What would you want to say to them? You have the stage right now. And I know you have your conference coming up and we'll, we'll hear more about that. But what it, what are some of the things tangibly that you'd want them to do? So I, it's hard because there's three people, really. There's like agents and editors and publishers. There's the writers. And then there's the AI program, like the people who are actually like making the programs. And I think I've pretty well said what I want from the AI program people. It's like, just make me some ethical like guidelines that people can. And Mm -hmm. like, if, if, if you're going to, like charge people to to test, then like you should be paying you should be paying them to test your program, not like charging them to test your broken program. Um, for writers, I would say like there is a lot of value in making little short stories in your universes if you want to make them and build them out and like I don't know doing poetry through like there's my friend has like a a thing you can put in uh you can put in like a piece of your text and like it will spit out like what if this was written by Hemingway or what if this was written by this character and like I don't know like those kind of things sound like fun harmless things I know how he like developed the, 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 the algorithm and all of the things that like go into it. So like, yeah, that's fine. I probably like that. It's probably okay to use those things. I probably wouldn't put them in something that you put out for paid or, uh, but having these things or building on them are like really interesting ways to improve your writing or build out a world. If you're a slow writer, or even to use an outline, as an outline to like a book or a story that you use, like no problem with any of those things because AI is meant to like do the mundane tasks that you don't want to do. However, on, at some point, you no longer are the writer or artist. I don't know what that point is. It's somewhere between you pointed a click and then you downloaded it and then you uploaded it and you had no input. And like writing the whole thing from scratch is like the the zenith point. And it's, and it is okay to hire people. The reason I'm saying it's okay to build out your world that way is you can hire people to write stories in your world. You can hire people to write books in your world. You can hire people to do things inside of your world. That is how most universes exist after a certain time. Uh, like, like Gene Roddenberry did not write the books for Star Wars after a time. I don't even know if you wrote any of them. Like, so all of that okay with. Not okay with you downloading a thing and passing it off as your own. Not okay with taking something that you had no control over or that you had no input in except putting some uh, some parameters in and submitting it to a publisher. Like, like let's just say you must put some effort into a story. And also, this is the biggest thing that I want writers to get away with it. Because for some reason... People think that like, think of publishers like they think of tech where there's like 10,000 people like writing the, like, 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 like uh, at a company. It's usually one person who is doing all of the submissions. So submitting a thousand things to them, especially when they're as mediocre as chat G- GDP or pseudo write is, is probably just going to irritate them and blacklist you anyway. So like maybe like the rule usually is like one a month. Or one until you get like a rejection and then you can submit again. So like just as a rule, like submit one thing, maybe two things if like they allow you to, but like follow the guidelines and then wait until the rejections come in or the acceptance comes in. And when you are, when you are submitting, please just say, I generated this through, 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 through a program because right. some people won't care. Some people will as an editor, publisher, 
et cetera, et cetera, most of the same rules apply. I think there's a very interesting case study where if you're 10,000 or 5,000 or someone pulls out of an anthology, can what are ethically, what are the rules for you just saying, well, I'm just going to have chat GDP write a 5,000 word story. And I'm going to disclose that it's a 5,000 word story that, that chat G GDP wrote it, but I will, I, can I add that into my collection? I don't know ethically or like what you can do in that matter for like monetarily, but like, I think that we're in a place where there are for writers and publishers. I, I, I want them to understand that there is a path forward but it must be an ethical path forward that does not destroy the publishing industry or the art industry as it exists now. And what if it th evolves those industries though? Well, that yeah. is a, that is, that is where the, 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 the teeter totter is, right? It's like, I think that there are great evolutions that publishing can do that, that, that can exist in publishing, but uh, I think it's very easy to start filling a 500 anthologies with like chat GDP stories and then flooding the market and putting 500 books out a month. And like, right. I am worried about that because like it takes no effort for someone to hit a sub hit a button and then get a story and then exactly. hit a button and get a cover exactly. and then putting it online. And Got it. And we're running up against the clock. And I really want to bring this up. What about the readers? So we've addressed the publishing industry and the writers and what they're supposed to do. I'm curious, and this is something I'm just kind of like throwing out to everybody watching. Yeah. Do you want to read stuff that's written by an AI? Does it matter if there's a human behind it or if it's a hybrid and somewhere in between? And maybe that question is a little bit rhetorical, but I'm just curious on your, your thoughts, panelists, of do you think that's gonna matter? How much is it gonna matter to people? And should people, should the readers go on Russell's side and say, hey, we demand publishers and writers that you don't do too much of this stuff? I, I think, uh, honestly, I think you can tell that you'll be able to tell the difference over time. Um, where some of this content is generated, like it, it literally, I, I really do, do, I have read chat enough chat GPT stuff right now. And I have used it for like, we needed to come up with keywords for an event I was doing. And so I asked chat GPT, what are the keywords for this event? Now it pulled from search engines, but it was a great, you know, something that I would have had an intern do, you know, mm -hmm. or put into word, give me thesaurus words or whatever, you know, I thought mm -hmm. that was fantastic. But I do think, you know, right now, and this is going to change, that these engines don't have irony. They don't have modulation. They don't, they're not human beings. And so over, now there may be a bunch, a new generation of folks that don't know the difference because they don't know any better. And maybe that's where we're headed as a culture. And that doesn't make me happy. But I think you can tell the difference and you will over time. You know, um, when something is just a regurgitation, when something is feels Wikipedia like, you right. know, versus really true. And it, it, it's it's learning, though, too. I think moving forward, there will be no AI advising people to boil babies. It's listening to us and it's it's following all of that. So it's learning as it's going. So I'm just curious yeah. about the future as we kind of come up to the end of the clock here. Where do you see this? Because we, we get where we're at now and where we are maybe a year or two five years, 10 years, what do you guys predict? Pull out your crystal balls. Where are we going? I well, think I, there's going to be, yeah, oh, no. No, I think, no there's gonna, I, I think people are going to have an industry that is transhumanist and they're just gonna be like, I want the AI. There's gonna be people that are like, I love AI, I want AI. There's gonna be people that are like, I don't care, I just want a good story. And in fairness, there are stories that are much better for AI generation than others. Like there are like very rote paint by number stories that probably AI is going to be able to get. And then there's gonna be people that's like, I don't want this, I just want humans. And they're all just gonna to have to learn to exist together. They're probably, I would imagine Amazon or someone else will probably have like a silo for like AI generated stories and then non AI generated stories. That's the easy way to go about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think we're gonna just look with NFTs or anything else that's come along. Like, just gonna have to find a way to hopefully ethically live together with these things over time. Yeah, I, I was seeing the same thing where maybe you buy a book and like the first half is original and the second half is generated by AI. Maybe it is something that we weave into our culture, 
And as it gets more sophisticated, we have to get more sophisticated. I mean, it's, it's, this, it's just the nature of, you know, we're, we're just in an interesting moment in time where our culture and our society is moving at a really fast pace. And I'm not saying it's all good, but I think we, we do continue to iterate and evolve when we're met with challenges. That, that, that is the nature of humanity. And so I, I am mostly filled with hope and uh, excitement about where things are going. And that's um, one of the reasons you both are on this panel. Lori represents <laughs> hope and light, and Russell is, you know, dystopian. Well, in, in, in all fairness, a little bit, Russell, a little bit. Russell's in the middle of a very specific storm right now, and so I appreciate and respect that because I don't have the challenges that you have in that particular category and vertical. You're actually living in. You're in the war right now. Um, and I'm more of a commenter on, on the on the war, but um, but I, I have as just someone who looks at trends, I have seen these wars before, and we usually 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 emerge with solutions. And sometimes it's worse than it was before. Sometimes it's better, and that's again just the nature of humanity. That's no. how we progress. Russell, uh, I'll give you a moment. I'll give you both a moment just to say your closing thoughts and let us know what's going on. Because you have that, Russell, you have that great um, conference that you keep bringing up. Can you tell us I, really quick I, what that I is? I do. Well, I want. can I give you a good use case for, for AI before? Because I, I, I feel like, sure. I, okay, so you go to Amazon, you put, you click, you, you go into their AI platform. Uh, back end and you say, I want to read a romance novel with these four tropes done this and, 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 and Amazon generates you a novel on the spot that is unique to you. And that is a potentially very cool reader use case for AI. And I think some people will just say, I don't, I, I'm not finding what I want. I just want another siren novel that like is friends to lovers and X, Y, and Z. And then will it be the best novel that's ever created? no it probably won't be but like does that really matter when you just want to like feel like the the, the so, warm so tingles Lori could get her loki romance novel if she wanted to right sure like you could go to the <laughs> you could go to disney and maybe it can generate a novel for you based on some parameters there but like that is yeah. that is like the far end of like what is possible on this platform um i do have a conference it's called uh the future of publishing mastermind we have a virtual component have a membership component and then we have an in-person component in new orleans which is application only um it's basically about all of this stuff it's about how we survive for the next three to five years as uh as as writers publishers if you're interested uh, you can go to future of publishing mastermind.com and apply um hopefully we'll see the, the in-person conference is next february uh, 2024, uh, the, from the 26th to the 29th uh, uh, in uh, New Orleans. And then we have Excellent. the virtual component in March. Excellent. Thank you, Russell. Lori, closing thoughts. Uh, well, I, I think I kind of said it that I, I do think, you know, the future is mostly bright. I think we, we do have to figure out what our checks and balances need to be that the best use of AI is with a human companion and partnership, and it's a tool, um, and not to get intimidated by all the negative utopias and um, negative science fiction tropes that you know have really influenced us to be so terrified of everything. But I do think we have to be on our guard. We have to pay attention, just like I am as a parent with my um, with my daughter. Um, and some events I have coming up are the uh, NAB show in Vegas in April. Um, which is all about the future of content and broadcasting, and also the Infinity Festival in the fall in Los Angeles, which is also about storytelling and technology. So I'm definitely looking at all of these things, not as a publisher, but more as a content creation um, and the future of entertainment. And uh, I think it's an exciting time. It absolutely is exciting stuff. Lori and Russell, thank you so much for joining us on the Book Fest Spring 2023. I appreciate it.